the name of God who gives us minds to think, and hearts to love, and hands to serve. Amen. Amen. Well, what a great blessing it is in this 100th year of our gospel mission as the Episcopal Diocese of Southwestern Virginia to begin with worship and the Holy Eucharist celebrated by our presiding bishop. We are so glad you are here. We are graced and we are encouraged by your presence and we look forward with great anticipation to your time among us. We are now in the midst of revival. We've been preparing and we've been praying for it for months. Stephanie might even say since the last time she was here, a year ago. We sorely need our hearts and our minds set anew on Christ Jesus and his good news for our lives. We need a deeper commitment to the way of love. In 1919, when our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus set off on their own as a brand new diocese against great odds, and I'll speak of some of those odds tomorrow in my address, I bet they wondered if they could make a good go of it. In his first annual convention address, Bishop Jett, the first bishop of this diocese, declared, in the first place, we must proceed at once to make this diocese a spiritual force. That's wonderful, isn't it? Make this diocese a spiritual force. Now, while they would still have the prayers of their brothers and sisters in southern Virginia, they were now, with an official division, most definitely on their own. What would the future hold among these mountains and rivers? Whatever their doubts, they committed themselves to each other, and they set their hope on Christ. They determined to be a spiritual force. And here we all are. One hundred years later, we are strong and we are faithful, and we are still in this great mission field. But we are not at the end of a journey. Right? Rather, we are at the beginning of the next big chapter in the continuing 2,000-year evolution of the Jesus movement. Thanks be to God. So how will it go? What are the obstacles? How will we gather the strength for the journey ahead in the next chapters of our mission as the Episcopal Church in southwestern Virginia? Now to the missionary team that he has assembled and been coaching up, Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Go on your way, carry no purse, no bag, no sandals. Get on out there, team, and make it happen. Wait, what, Jesus? Can we have a few more details? Is there perhaps a notebook to go with this game plan? Several years ago, Martha put this little book in my Christmas stocking. It is the worst case survival scenario survival handbook. <laughs> worst case scenario survival handbook. It's not a joke. It offers real survival how-tos from real experts. And I have learned many useful things from it. There are some basics like how to hotwire a car, or how to deal with a down power line, or even how to perform an emergency tracheotomy with a sharp knife and a straw. But more worst case, you can also learn the best strategies for fending off a cougar, a shark, or one of my greater fears, an alligator. Now these are scenarios that could arise in my life, and so I'm interested and I'm appreciative to have the information. Now while this little book is not a joke, I do find many of the worst case scenarios amusing, which is why I have collected other editions in the series. For instance, there are instructions on how to maneuver on top of a moving train and get inside. <laughs> There's how to leap from a motorcycle to a car and how to jump from a building into a dumpster. Now I cannot 
Imagine a scenario where I will find myself on top of a moving train or needing to leap from a motorcycle into the open window of a moving car. But then life is unpredictable. <laughs> now I suppose I could find myself in a building fire considering jumping several stories down into a dumpster. The very first instruction for jumping from a building into a dumpster is this. Jump straight down. <laughs> if, if, if you leap off and away from the building at an angle, you will miss the dumpster. <laughs> Resist your natural tendency to push off. This sounds like good advice, but it doesn't fill me with great confidence. And oh, there is, this is one of the things I love about the book. There is this addition of this note. Be aware, the dumpster may be filled with bricks or other unfriendly materials. <laughs> now, this is, after all, a book for worst case scenarios. So, if jumping from a building into a dumpster is your la last option, jump straight down, aim for the center of the dumpster, and pray that it's full of friendly materials like cardboard boxes and an old mattress. Luke tells us how Jesus prepares to send a team of 70 to spread the, his message of love and reconciliation. They are to travel light with hardly any possessions. They are to carry no cash, no backpack. They are to eat and sleep as hospitality is, is extended to them along the way. It does not look as though they are going to have a worst-case scenario survival handbook. And I'm sure they might have wished to have more guidance and more direction. There was surely great trepidation among them and many, you know, what if type questions. Hey Jesus, what if we have to jump from a building into a dumpster? Or deliver a baby in a taxi cab? But Jesus just simply instructs them to be on their way, adding, see, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Great. <laughs> now, what those first disciples did have was their knowing Jesus and experiencing his ministry. And they had his teaching. And this would have to be enough. You see, Jesus knows that proclaiming God's kingdom of radical love and justice will indeed be risky business. It makes no sense for him, really, to sugarcoat it, right, for this early missionary team. He knows the cost. And this has always been the case for those who venture out from the comfortable sidelines into the places of risk and challenge. You see, the real frontier of proclaiming a message of love and forgiveness will always push up against prejudice, anger, and human selfishness. In a 50th anniversary historical piece about the early days of this diocese, the Reverend John Welford, who was then rector of Emmanuel Covington, wrote this. We were in a real sense a missionary diocese functioning under rather primitive conditions. When in 1926, I was sent as a deacon, listen up deacons, by Bishop Jett, to one of the mission churches in the coal fields of the far southwest. It was not uncommon to witness a shootout on the main street of the town. Therefore, many of the local inhabitants refrained from doing their shopping on Saturday afternoons. <laughs> and at another mission, while conducting a service, I was handed a piece of paper on which was written, Do not leave the church by the front door. A man is standing out front with a pistol to shoot you. <laughs> now, I'm not sure what Father Welford was preaching. <laughs> but importantly, and not funny, it was getting someone's attention. Throughout his gospel and on through the Acts of the Apostles, St. Luke tells the many ways that Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit mysteriously compels women and men to spread the gospel into unknown circumstances and into unfamiliar territory. In every generation, 
baptized followers of Christ Jesus are to make themselves available to the work of the forward mission of the gospel. Every Sunday, as we listen to the gospel proclaimed, we hear the accounts of those who went forward with courage and conviction to commend the faith that was in them and to make disciples in the name of Jesus. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, Jesus said. Now go, make disciples. So we go under Jesus' authority. Fear of the unknown, fear of how we will respond when placed in unfamiliar territory, fear of worst-case scenarios. These fears can keep us from engaging the work we are called into as those baptized in the name of Christ. What would happen in the next town? What will I say? What if I'm not welcomed? What if I get attacked by a cougar? (laughs) Heading out without the necessary reservations, the required clothing, the needed supplies could have many unintended consequences. No bag, no supplies, no money, no thank you very much. You all just go on without me and let me know how it goes. Most of us, if we are honest, we would prefer not to be pushed into situations where the possibility for a worst case scenario is high. We do not like to be put out. Being put out is a state that we instinctively avoid, right? But putting ourselves out for the sake of others, for love, is what the gospel calls us into. Each of us has had and will continue to have opportunities to reach out to a stranger or connect with someone we don't know well. And in a given circumstance, we may hesitate, let the moment pass, and then perhaps regret. You know that we did not say something or do something in that moment of opportunity. I'm sure you've had those moments. More likely, we will also be confronted with opportunities to speak up for justice and peace. We find ourselves in the midst of gossip, prejudice, and intolerance. These are moments when it is surely easier to remain silent. But disciples of Christ Jesus cannot be quiet wallflowers. Throughout the gospel narrative, unsuspecting folks are called and sent by God. Most are hesitant in the beginning and pretty much reluctant. When those first missionary teams were sent out, they had to draw on their faith in Jesus' teachings while trusting in the mysterious power of the Holy Spirit. They were to cast out demons and heal the sick. And those who Jesus called into ministry in his name were to travel light with a faith deep enough to preach the gospel of Christ with their words and with their actions, come what may. They did not need anything else. And neither do we. They were reading Jesus, reading Jesus with their minds and their hearts. And we are called to do the same. This is why we, the people of God, continue to read and ponder these stories of calling and discipleship. And unlike that first missionary team, we do have the gospel texts and a really great prayer book as guides and handbooks along the way, and that's good news. The deeper we immerse ourselves in Jesus' teachings and actions, the more we will be available to be used by the Holy Spirit as instruments of God's grace and love. This is the revival we need. As we begin the next 100 years of our gospel mission, let us pray for God's Holy Spirit to revive us and call us back to our baptism so that we are inspired, so that we are strengthened, to go out telling the story of Jesus to a world that desperately needs its hope and healing balm. Let us renew Bishop Jett's beginning call for this diocese of southwestern Virginia to be a strong spiritual force. Let us pray hard in these next two days for revival, for the love of Christ, and for the sake of the world. Amen.